That's right, you, you, you've got to wait. You <laughs> yeah. can't quite finish yeah, it sorry, off. Yeah, sorry, Simon. Um, and without further ado, I'll pass over to Simon, because, of course, I don't have to introduce you. Yeah, no. okay. okay, good. Right? Okay, so, uh, let's see. Have you had a good week? Yeah. yeah. Plenty of food, anyway. So, maybe food for the brain as well, I hope. Um, so, the ability to write good research papers is absolutely central uh, not only to your career prospect, but also to doing good research. So what I want to do in this talk is just to make seven very concrete, immediately actionable suggestions that I think will make your papers better. Um, but the ground rules are the same as in the, the talk about giving a talk. Uh, this is slightly less recursive, um, which is, uh, this is not a subject on which there are any right answers. Right? So there's no, in a, I have no monopoly on truth here. So please um, ask questions or indeed make comments from your own experience um, as we go along. That would be more fun for me. We will still finish um, at 12, as uh, mentioned at the end of uh, last talk. Okay. Yes? You said that there's no right answers. Are there, are there any answers that are definitely wrong? Oh, are there any answers that are definitely wrong? Uh, probably not, actually. You know, to everything there is a counterexample. But I'm just going to err on the side of being highly opinionated and saying things that I believe to be true. And then you can be free to disagree with them and fight with your supervisor about them. OK. So here's the first thing. Uh, just start writing. Right, so here is a typical plan for doing research. First of all, you have some idea. And then you spend some months or even a year or two developing the idea. And then you write the paper. That sounds logical, right? That's just good scholarship, isn't it? Utterly wrong. Here is what you should do, right? You have an idea, you start to write the paper. And in writing the paper, you think, oh, I didn't really understand that idea very well. That sort of forces you to refine the idea, and you, you, uh, so, so the act of writing the paper sort of forces out the research, as it were. What can happen with, uh, with this plan is you have the idea, you start, write, you start, you do the research, and after a year, you start to write the paper, and you think, darn. Six months of that year were completely wasted, and there's another six months left to do on bits that I didn't realize that I didn't understand, right? So I'm a functional program. I like lazy evaluation. So this is like lazy evaluation, right? You've got to, you start writing the paper. Use that as a forcing function for doing the research. And not a, oh, drat. Um, not only is it a good forcing function, but it also, um, uh, it's, it's a good way of trying to make yourself articulate what it is that you're doing. So I can't tell you how often I've started to write a paper and I've realized that something I thought I understood, I don't understand after all. But when you write it down, it all seems, you know, by the time you actually get it in letters on paper, it seems more complicated than you thought it was, right? So it, it kind of crystallizes your ideas in a very concrete way. Um, and that can make it much clearer where you don't understand. Um, and also, another really good thing about writing a paper is it's something you can share with other people. While you've got all this stuff swirling about in your head, it's very difficult for anybody else to uh, comment on it or indeed engage in any dialogue with you. You can sometimes do that one-to-one -one with somebody else, um, but often that's a bit disorganized. You know, you start a conversation with the whiteboard. It's all very good, but actually, you know, it's not something you can do in five minutes. So the, uh, your act of setting out your idea in, uh, in written form can be a very helpful way to, have a, to, to open a dialogue with somebody. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, for, for you personally, abstract first or last? Oh, I'm going to say lots about uh, content in a second. <laughs> I'm just talking at the moment. So the question was, do you write the abstract first or last? Actually last, but, um, uh, but, I'm gonna, but here I'm just concentrating on get started with writing early, because almost nobody does. Yes? Related to this, would you recommend submitting your paper before you do the research? Oh, no, well, actually, going all the way to submitting it to a major conference. So, no, not to major conferences, oh. but there are workshops or work in progress workshops yeah. or for graduate students, graduate consortiums. Absolutely. So, so, so yes, for sort of workshoppy things, do submit stuff that is in progress. Say that it's in progress, right? If you write it and you think, actually, this makes no sense at all, then you probably don't want to submit it. Right. But absolutely, uh, one of the nice things about computer science um, is that it's, it's a, like a fractal. It expands like a snowflake in, ahead of you. So everybody, turns out, is working in a different part of the snowflake, unlike, say, biochemistry, where everybody is converging on a particular, the boundary of science is very well defined. So people are kind of in competition. In computer science, you're much less in competition with other people, and so it's much easier to share. So yes, share half-baked ideas. Just advertise them as half-baked. Yes. What about, uh, what about 
What about positioning papers? What about positioning papers? Yes. I well, you mean I'm, I'm trying to work in this kind of area? Right. So yeah. I, I have a great idea. Yeah. I just didn't implement the algorithm, but I want to get my idea out there. So sure. The so system. provided the, 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 the venue is you know, open to that and you're upfront about what you're doing, absolutely. Right? Just about communication. You're trying to say, is anybody else interested in this idea? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yes, be, be open, speak early. But I'm, I'm almost, my, my main point here is really to do with almost communication with yourself. Right? It's about starting writing, but also the dialogue with others is important. OK? Um, so the one thing just about having, um, having ideas is, oh, I, I think I've sort of, by, by the way, <laughs> more or less said this, that uh, for me, writing, writing is not an output medium, right? The, the, this, this, is, this is sort of uh, where the paper is like the printer at the end of the algorithm, right? For me, writing is the way that you develop the ideas in the first place. It, it's, the, it's, the, it's the machinery of research, not the output, not the printer for research. Does that make sense? I, 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 that's what works for me. Um, let's see. Um, so if you're going to do this, number two is you need to know what your idea is. And that is often not terribly clear in advance, but it must be clear when it's finished. But I'd like to just articulate what, what, what is this business about an idea. So I think of a paper as um, rather like the talk that I was, I was speaking about on, on, on Tuesday as a kind of vehicle for conveying an idea from your head into what's your name? Fraser, OK. So my paper is a vehicle for conveying my idea from my head into Fraser's head. right? So it's, it's like a, a virus. I, I put it on the paper. Fraser reads it. It goes into his brain. And if it's successful, it sort of takes root there. And you know, he becomes a carrier. And he you know, infects other people. So, it's a, and it, it's a, so it's a, the, the paper is not a sort of you know, way of getting research brownie points. It's an idea conveying mechanism. Right? And with a bit of luck, Fraser, it's not, I put it in a rather, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, dystopian view, but, but, but I hope you might hope that Fraser is sort of excited about the idea and think that's cool and interesting and maybe I could build on it and do new things. That's, and I put Mozart up here because I think of, you know, Mozart wrote pieces of music that we are still, let's think of them as his papers, right? And we are still reading his papers in, in concert halls, right? We just, uh, of course, the, the interpretation is, you know, huge, huge part of musicianship. But the fact is that the ideas that he wrote down were so persuasive and catchy and um, interesting that people are still looking at 100 years later or hundreds of years later. I'd be astonished if anybody's looking at any of my papers in 100 years' time, but it would be very exciting if they were. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so, so uh, and, and the ideas are more durable than anything else. You know, you may implement stuff, you may give talks, you may, uh, um, you, you may do a number of other things in research, research, but I think in a way that your papers are the most durable part of your output. They are the things that uh, future generations of students may read and think, you know, Fraser's paper really changed my life. You know, and I can point to some papers that did change my life. So, and that's a, um, in a way that implementations sometimes do, but not so much. So we often focus on tools and implementations. Actually, it's the papers that are the durable piece. Um, oh, and a bit about communication. Uh, if you have a great idea, because you're brilliant, which I'm sure you are, and you sit in your cell having the idea, and you do not communicate with anybody, then what are you? A heat generator, right? <laughs> not so cool, right? The, the, however good your idea is, if you don't succeed in communicating them, they do, are not benefiting humanity, and that's what we're here to do. So it's not sort of, and communicating ideas, too, is a way of discovering whether they're any good. You show them to people, they say that, you know, they, they, you know sometimes they catch fire and spread, and sometimes they don't. That's a good winnowing mechanism. So, um, um, so but, but if you don't attempt to communicate in as articulate a way as you can, and persuasive way as you can, then you're, you know, you're, you're hiding your light under, under a bushel. Don't worry, people will filter them out if they're bad ideas, right? But if you don't tell them, they don't have that chance, okay? All right, so um, uh, then we have to wonder about this idea. So uh, the, 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 the worry is, if you look at other people's papers, you go to any conference or look at any conference proceedings journal, you look at other people, hey, that's a really good paper. That's a good paper. They, they have great ideas, all these people. They must be very intelligent. I, oh, I am a mere worm. My ideas are pitiful and weedy, and nobody would be interested in them. Right? This is what everybody feels. Right? We all feel that the stuff that we're doing is not very significant, unless you're a remarkably strong-minded or possibly arrogant person. But I promise you that most computer scientists feel 
this sense of insignificance by compared to the, you know, the glorious reality of research in your field. Um, but I think um, the, 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 bit, the pot bottom is, is, is important, that even if your idea seems a bit weedy and, and insignificant, just write a paper about it anyway. Right? You're not committing to publishing it at a you know, top-tier conference. You're just committing to writing it. When you write it, it may turn out, indeed, that it was a weedy and insignificant idea, and then not much is lost, right? You've just articulated it clearly. But um, maybe, and very often this happens to me, I start writing a paper about something I think is not so cool, and, and then I find it actually takes me 12 pages of double-column, eight-point font just to explain enough about what it is for it to be comprehensible to other people. In other words, it's turned out to be bigger and more interesting than I expected. That's very common. Right? Occasionally you discover, no, it isn't, but often you will. So the, 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 this is another get started thing. Don't wait until you have a good idea to write something. Write stuff about any idea. Does, does that, you, have you got the, got the message there? Right? Don't wait to have a good idea, because nobody does. We only discover that they're good ideas later. Right? They're really important because everybody has this problem. And it's very disabling if you wait till you have an idea that you think is cool, cool enough. OK. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, last little piece about, about ideas is that um, when you write a paper, by the time you are finished at least, you must be clear about what the idea is. You may not be very clear right at the beginning. This goes back to the question about abstracts, right? So that you. Um, uh, you, uh, but, but, but by the time you've finished, you really ought to be able to articulate what your idea is. And I'll have, have more to say about that later. But the, the bottom point is the important thing. Sometimes you find, you've, I read a paper and I think, um, oh, well, that's got several ideas. And they've got so smushed together, they've been sort of squeezed into the, you know, the compass of a 10-page paper. And you haven't done justice to any of them. Right? So if you have lots of ideas, you know, praise be, write lots of papers. This is not salami slicing. That is writing many papers about one idea. That's writing many papers about many ideas. Okay? So re resist the temptation to just, you know, skate lightly over many ideas. Just try to, try to focus and be clear what the idea is. Sometimes there's a very closely related family. This is a kind of, you know, there's no, nothing is completely true. But this is a good baseline to start from. Okay? Um, and so uh, this is some... Uh, Joe Touch, I gave a nice talk I, I, I was at in which he said, he, do you remember the hunt for Red October? And uh, where Captain, whoever it is, says, just one ping. They send out a sort of some bounce to another submarine. Only one, right? So that's a, and the, the ping is the idea. So, a good, so here's a good exercise. When you read somebody else's paper, close the paper and, and try to say, what is the idea that I learned from that paper? What is the key thought? in that paper. You should be surprised how, or how hard it can be. Indeed, I have found myself, um, as a reviewer, writing in my review, I believe that the key idea in this paper is da dum da dum da dum But I'm not really sure, because the author didn't really tell me. And so I write that in my review, because I want the, re the author to think, well, well, that wasn't my key idea at all. So, you know, the reviewer completely misunderstood. They might then reshape it. They might think, yes, that was the key idea. I should make it more explicit. So, you know, I would encourage you to be totally explicit, and to, um, uh, to write something that says, here is the key idea. I sometimes write a section that says, you know, the main idea, that's a section heading, right? So leave your reader in no doubt when they get to the bit that matters. Because papers have a lot of stuff. They have some background material, some setup that's actually, you know, it's, it's not, that's not the new part, but it's essential to understand the new part. You've got to signpost clearly to say, all right, we've reached the end of setup, right? Now we're going to tell you the new piece. Don't leave them in any doubt, OK? Okay, so that's so much for the uh, um, uh, sort of why to write papers and what the main payload is, your idea. I just want to say a little bit about structure. So far, so good. Any other observations or questions? Yes? So, I'm not so sure about the form of the paper and whether it's the best way to go. Um, I mean, in general, but since this talk is about how to write a good paper, then yeah. let's not argue about that. I mean, just as... as, as um, as a tool to bring your ideas into paper or into something you can present and share with other people, do you really think a paper in its current construction of you know abstract and, and I don't know uh, some background and then formulation is this really the way to go or do you yeah I do actually and I'll say why I'll say why 
Ah, you, so, so a blog post might be a, another way to communicate. Exactly. Yes, but I would think that a blog post ha often has rather similar structure. Let's get there. Let's get there. Any, anyone else? Yeah. The question: uh, What about the thing called literature programming? Like when you just, like you know, when you combine a code with actually the art with art. Oh, literate programming. When you're writing a, a document that sort of somehow interweaves code and exposition, yeah. right? So. Um, um, so, uh, sometimes I have seen papers that are literate programs. They, really, they say, you know, here's a pointer to the source code of the paper and you can run it. That can be great. And for some, you know, for some kinds of papers, that's perfect. If you're doing bioinformatics, it might not be so, so easy to do that. Um, but yeah, and, and the, other, the other concern there is that if you have to present all the code because you want to execute it, then that may overwhelm the, the idea in the paper. So it's a, it's a choice. But certainly, if, you, if you're presenting code, Having actually run all that code to make sure there's no bugs in it, that would be a good thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's say a little bit about structure. So uh, here's some. Uh, here's a story. So so going back to your question about medium, right? So my um, my mental model for a paper, or for a blog post, or for a personal conversation is: I kind of imagine that I'm standing at a whiteboard with a friend and I want to convey my idea. So what am I going to do? I'm going to say, here's the problem I'm trying to solve. I'm going to say, you know, here, it's an interesting problem, and here's why. Moreover, it's an unsolved problem. That is, you know, there is something to do. It's not already been done. And now I'm going to tell you about my idea. This is how, this is how I'm going to do it. And then I'm going to um, uh, give you some evidence to make you believe that the idea actually works in practice. Um, get, you know, I'm going to explore some of the detail. And then I might tell you something about how my idea compares to other people's approaches. Right. This is a kind of storyline. If you had, you know, if you were with somebody for an hour, you might might tell them. And I think this is something you might do in a blog post as well, right? That that narrative story. It might also be might all be briefer than in a paper, but the storyline might be similar. Does that does that make sense? Um, and it might and it makes sense in a personal conversation as well. Um, so how does this turn into into papers? Well, once we're talking about the medium of a paper, so I'm now thinking mainly about sort of conference format, you know, 10 or 12 pages of fairly dense font. But it apl this applies equally well to a journal paper, um, or even to a short form paper, but the, um, uh, or even to a thesis, actually. But, um, so here in the sort of size of a paper is what you, what you get. Title, uh, you know, abstract, introduction. Introduction, try to fit the introduction on the first page, at least if you're in a format that has a decent amount of text on the first page. Um, and then, then you say something about what the problem is, something about what your idea is, Something about evidence about why it's a good idea. Something about related work, and, and then we're, and then you're finished, okay? But the look at the bit at the right. The readership drops off pretty sharply. Of course, I, this is not data. I've just guessed these numbers. But some people are going to scan the contents contents pages and maybe abstracts. Um, some people will read the introduction, and by the time they finish the first page, they're making this mental decision: Shall I just move on to the next paper in this proceedings? You've got to think of those readers, right? They're, they're, uh, you, you've got to, uh, you know, for, that you lose a factor of 10, I reckon, after page one. That's an important part of your strategy for writing a paper, um, is what to do with page one. Okay? So this is my sort of general story, and I want to say a little bit about each of these parts. Um, so uh, I, I want to start with the beginning, introduction, um, the introduction part. What are, we, what are we going to say in the introduction? Well, and this is about contribution. So here's my what I think introductions are, are good uh, to be like. To introduce the problem and to state what your contributions are. And that's all you can fit in the introduction. All right, so what do I mean by introduce the problem? So I always try to introduce the problem with an example. Right? So he, this particular paper, this is one of my papers from some time ago. And right there, after four lines of text, I've got some typewriter font with an actual program. Right? That, and, some, and my hope is that somebody reads that and thinks, oh, I get, I get an idea of what this paper is about now. Because it's not phrased in vague abstract terms. It's phrased in some executable code. <laughs> um, so using an example is very good. And it's, and it's right up front, right? very, very near the beginning. I'm right there saying, here is the problem I'm trying to solve. Okay. And then there isn't at this point enough, enough space to say, here's how other people have solved it. And uh, you need, might need to say something about why it's an interesting and important problem. Um, but it can't be too hard a problem. So I call this mountains versus molehills. So here's an example of what you see at the beginning of some papers. You know, computer programs have bugs, and bugs are very bad. And you know, cite uh, uh, reams of papers that say, uh, you know, have software engineering statistics about the cost of fixing bugs. Right? Now, when you read a paper like that, does your blood begin to race? 
do you begin to think, wow, I didn't know that bugs were bad. I didn't know that lots of programs had bugs or that they were expensive. Ah, oh, this is a paper I absolutely must read. Is that what you think? Of course not. You think, oh, yeah, 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 right? You, let's get to the payload. Do you see what I mean? It seems worthy. It seems, you know, like good scholarship, but it's completely demotivating for your reader. Instead, you want to cut very quickly to something. So that's what I call describing a mountain. You know, you're describing Mount Everest, and it's plain that your paper is not going to conquer Mount Everest because that's like a, you know, a thousand careers are going to, you know, still only be in the foothills. You want to describe a little hill, right? A little foothill that you're going to conquer, or at least make a decent assault on. So here's a, you know. Consider this program. This is actually a bit like uh, uh, this one, right? I gave a particular program. Here's a little program. It has a particular kind of bug in it. You know, look, you can see the bug here. So I'm going to tell you how to find this class of bugs, right? Um, and I'm going to, you know, and, and I'm going to give you some guarantees about that, or at least I'm going to get, give you a good stat. Do you see what I mean? So you've you've made the problem small enough that it's believable that you might solve it, and also that a reader thinks, oh, oh actually, that's kind of an interesting bug. If you could really do that, that would be pretty cool. Do you know what I mean? They know you're not going to do the thing at the top. So don't waste their time. This is page one, right? This is the moment at which you have lots of readers. And they're all, you know, falling off the bus. OK. Um, so that's your sort of motivation part. And then, so there's motivation. What are you trying to solve? And then there's contributions. Now, uh, quite a lot of papers do have an explicitly, explicitly say the contributions of this, this paper or this. So this is a, but a surprisingly large number don't. I would say it's probably about 50-50. Um, and so um, you're, I, I think of it like this. The contributions of your paper are like the specification of a program, and the body of the paper is like the implementation. So when you read the contributions, that's like the spec. What you want the reader to do is to think, wow, if you know, uh, the, the author could deliver on those promises, that would be amazing. Yeah, I want to find out how they can do that. See what I mean? So, uh, and so you need to be a bit specific. So here's an example from another paper I wrote. So, blah, blah, blah. This is the sort of tail end of some motivational piece. And then I say, in this paper, we put the choice on a firmer basis. And then there's a sequence of bullets that describe the specific contributions of the paper. I, personally, I would urge you to use that style, to literally say, the contributions are these, and then give a list of bullets. Because they're like claims. Right? In, in a proof engine, they're like the, 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 the theorems that you're going to prove. So you want to say claim one, claim two, claim three. You probably don't write that, but that's what you're thinking. Right? Each one is a claim that you are going to substantiate later. And that the reader thinks, oh, and moreover, it must be a refutable claim. Um, let's see. So the, there are some in, irrefutable claims. You sometimes see this kind of thing in introductions. Right? Uh, we study the properties of this formal system. You know, we describe the Wiswall system. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, we've used WizWars in practice, and you think uh, we're going to tell you about that. And again, does that make you think, this sounds fantastic. They're going to study the properties of a formal system. Um, well, no, it's an irrefutable hypothesis. Of course you are going to study the properties of your formal system if that's what your paper's introducing, right? You are not telling the reader anything new. But if you say instead, you know, this is, a stat, this is a type system. We are going to prove, you know, it, we're going to prove that it's, uh, you know, type checking is, uh, the type system is sound, you know, obeys, you know, um, progress and preservation, and that um, type checking is decidable. Well, now you've said something, right? And pr presumably in an earlier bullet, you've said something about that it's a type system with some somewhat ambitious aims. Do you see the difference, right? So it must be, you must state in your contribution something which could be false. You must state in the contributions things that could be false. Got it? Uh, I think that's really important. And it's surprising how often people don't do that, even when they do have contribution sections. Are you with me? Any other any observations? No. Uh, I want you to notice one other thing here is that I've, um, uh, I've got forward references. In this language of these bullets, I've got these forward references to sections in the paper. So. Uh, and I did, we did that here. Did you see here? Mm -hmm. We explained precisely section four. Blah, blah, blah. We discussed in section five and six and contrast in section seven. And what that says is what you should not do is um, have a, uh, you often you see in introductions, uh, motivation, contributions, and then the rest of this paper is structured as follows. In section two, we do this. In section three, we do that. How many of you read that, read that paragraph? Yes? Well, you know, about 50% of papers do this. And when you read it, 
Are you thinking, wow, section two is going to be about this. I'm so thrilled, right? Do you read that section? Do you read that paragraph very carefully? You skip it, don't you? Everybody skips it. And it's on page one, which is your most precious page. So don't waste those precious bites on the front page with stuff that nobody is going to read. Instead, uh, instead of this stuff, you see, putting it in the narrative, uh, like I was doing here, uh, here and, and here, now uh, these have a much different status. But now you're making claims, and for every claim, you're giving a forward reference to where in the paper you're going to substantiate that claim. And that is genuinely helpful to reviewers, because they can look at the claims, and if you don't have the forward reference, they say, well, I wonder where in the paper I would find substance for this, so they leave through it and they miss it, right? You want to say as precisely as you can where the evidence is. And that, then that's actually useful, and it comes so naturally into the flow of, a, of something like this. It's really good. Strongly recommend this, yes. This is, we're still on page one. Yeah, we're still on page one. So these contributions can't spread too long either. You've got to sort of compress them to say what, what yeah, we're still on page one. Yeah. Do you have to write a version of these, like saying which are the things that you have to cut down when you are, I mean, shrinking the paper? Because most of these things also, I mean, that you have said, I mean, uh, allow us to cut down or shrink the paper. Oh, you can't cut this to shrink the paper. Yeah, yeah. This is page one. Yeah, and, and, I mean, for example, most of the time for the submissions, I have like eight pages, but yep. I have like 10, 14. Yeah, um, it's tough. It, so you have eight pages, you've got 10 pages of text. This is the page you cannot shrink. One page, which is most, you know, a third of which is title and authors is what you've got to state your contributions and, and the problem. Don't shrink that. Don't try to put you know, the payload on, on, on page one. I think because this is the bit that people will read, right? And so you have to have enough content here that they know whether to carry on. You know, it's tough for the rest, I know, because then you've only got seven pages left. But it's your specification. It's the driving force for the whole paper. Um, actually, you can use it for garbage collection as well. Uh, right, so if you find that, uh, oh, what, what do we have? Right, each claim in the introduction is pointed to, and then you find section four is not referred to at all from the list of contributions. So maybe section four is dead code. That could be a good way to shrink your paper, right? Or you think, ah, oh, no, section four is really important because I make a contribution in it, in which case you might add to your contribution list. See what I mean? This isn't a universal rule. I have papers in which I don't, I have sections that are playing an important role that I don't refer to from the intro. But it's a good first step, is to say, is every section referred to? And if not, why not? Yeah? Uh, for things like extended abstracts and notes, um, where you only have four or five pages, would you? Oh, yes. Would you recommend spending kind of as much? I don't know. So if you've only got four or five pages, now you're into territory where you know, a whole page is like 20% of your paper. You have to, uh, it, it's probably a somewhat different medium. You may have to compress it somehow. So I suppose I'm thinking maybe I really mean 10% of your paper rather than um, uh, exactly one page. Yeah. And, I mean, the, the big thing I'm trying to say here is think about that page one. Think of it as, the, as a driving force for your paper and think about your readers and the fact that that's the time you've got to get them hooked. And that applies to any, any medium. Blog posts, too, actually. You know, people scan the beginning of a blog post, want to know whether to carry on. OK? Uh, all right. Uh, so uh, we talked about this. Um, oh, and just when I talked about evidence, right, the, the body of the paper is the evidence. By evidence, I don't necessarily mean data. Right? It might be data, it might be performance measurements, it might be theorems that you proved, but it might also just be argumentation. Right? A substantial argument that explains why your claim is, uh, holds. You know? So it, it's all sorts of things. It might be a case study. Uh, might be illustrative examples. Might be lots of examples. That, so I don't, mean any, I don't mean anything terribly crisp by evidence. I just mean it's the substantiating part. OK. All right. Uh, so that's um, uh, so much. So we're still on page one, right? We're at, where it's uh, 11.33, and we've only got to page one. Uh, and what comes next on uh, many people's um, uh, contents list is related work. 
Right? It seems like good scholarship. What are you going to do? Uh, you're going to try to solve a problem. The first thing you to do is a scholarly uh, understanding of the state of the art in, your, in the problem before you began. That makes sense, doesn't it? It's terrible. It's just terrible. But this is what happens. Uh, oh, I, I think you should put, I'm going to explain why I think you should put it at the end. And you may have to fight with your advisor or supervisor about this, but uh, here we go. So here's why I think it's difficult, right? Remember, the goal is to convey your key idea. Right? This related work section is like a sandbar or barrier between your reader and your key idea. Your goal is to get you know, my idea from, from my head to Fraser's head as fast as possible. And if I put a, a, a say, before I can tell you about my idea, Fraser, I first of all have to tell you about uh, you know, the uh, notion of transactions from Brown and modified for distributed systems and, and you know, dealing with differential privacy and so forth. And you're thinking, I have no clue what any of this is about. So am I really going to still pay attention to Simon? Um, so there are several difficulties with this. So the first is that it makes them um, makes your readers uh, uh, think feel stupid, right? Um, uh, let's see. So uh, let me see how how can I put this? Yeah. So you're faced with a compromise. You got you're you're writing the paper. You're writing this related work section, and it keeps getting longer because to do a good job of describing related work, it takes a little while, right? And then you think. But now that I, you know, it's going to be three or four pages before we get to my idea, so I'll shrink it. So you remove every alternate sentence, right? And now you've sort of squished it. Now it becomes much harder to understand, right? And it's because after you've finished your paper, your reader will have um, a lot more intellectual scaffolding. They'll have more vocabulary. They'll have more examples. They'll just have more stuff in their head that will make the, uh, the um, state of the art comprehensible to them. Moreover, by the time you get to the end, uh, you also will have explained your idea so that you're, it's easy to make a smooth comparison between what you've done and what they've done, right? Whereas in related work at the beginning, you're sort of forced into an uneasy compromise about, about saying, well, this is the state of the art and we're going to improve in the following way, but I haven't, got, I haven't told you yet what we're going to do at all. You have no clue of what I'm going to do. So it's very, very uneasy. Um, and, uh, and, so, 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 and, and then your reader is reading this stuff, and they feel stupid because they don't understand it. Why don't they understand it? Because it's not their territory, primarily, and because you've compressed it to make it short. And they feel tired because they've tried to wade through this stuff. They thought, maybe I need to know this to understand the paper, which is probably false. Um, so they feel tired. So by the time they get to the idea, they're a bit worn out. They're not, their tails are not wagging. That make sense? Uh, so, uh, so I just think it much, works much better uh, to put it at the end, right? So if you put it um, uh, back here, then you have all the scaffolding. You can make smooth comparisons, and, uh, and you're good to go. Uh, that is not to say that on this earlier part, you should ignore related work. Right, so imagine that you were explaining something to, to somebody on the whiteboard, right? You're going to say, well, uh, you know, here's the problem, and here is the first way that you might think to approach it. And you know, you, you're probably going to just describe you know, a pathway to your idea. And that pathway is bound to be using ideas that you've, you, you know, from the giants on whose shoulders you are standing. And even on the whiteboard, you might say, this is an idea that you know, um, Mike Burroughs uh, developed when he, you know, when he developed BZIP. Um, but certainly, in a talk, you could have a little you know, square brackets Burroughs 93 just on the side. It needn't even form part of your soundtrack. It just reassures your audience, certainly your knowledgeable part of your audience, that you do actually know that this is standard work. You could say it's standard work, right? But the, the goal is for this initial part, describe the problem, describe your idea. It's an exposition in which you're taking the reader to your idea by the most direct path, right? And the most direct path will involve some mention of related work, and you should absolutely uh, mention that, describe it in as much detail as is necessary to get to your idea, and incidentally giving credit where credit is due. But your focus is leading your reader by the hand to, the, to your idea. It is not at that stage on giving credit to the, the um, related work. Does that make sense? Um, so it's where your focus lies. Um, now, when you get to write the related work section, which you absolutely must, I mean, so in talks, uh, may, there may not be time. In a paper that you, you know, that really is essential scholarship uh, to have related work to your paper, is, so here is something which you often find in related work sections, that um, the, uh, you know, the, the, you, you read it and it sounds a bit as if the, the author is saying, well, 
you know, brown and white did this, but it turned out to be really hopeless. And, you know, green and, and blue did this. And that was pretty hopeless too. And now, but my idea is fantastic. Um, but, so, so they're sort of not exactly denigrating, but somehow, you know, the opposition wasn't really very good. But life isn't like that. So put it like this. If I have, um, uh, uh, you know, 20 pounds in my pocket, here we are. Well, I'm, I, have, I have money in my wallet. So if I give this to Fraser, right, that, you, know, you can take it temporarily, Fraser. So I'm now 10 pounds poorer, and Fraser is 10 pounds richer, right? A transaction has taken place. Um, it's a sort of zero-sum game. Um, but on the other hand, if I, um, uh, you know, if Fraser is a friend of mine, and I give him love, right, and friendship, am I the poorer for it? Do I have less love to give to other people? No. Love is a sort of infinitely divisible commodity. Isn't that amazing? It's one of the wonderful things about human beings, is that we can, you know, you give love and you get more. It's kind of like the exact reverse of money. And credit is like that, right? So if you give credit to other people and you explain how clever they were and how inspiring their work was to you, um, then that doesn't make you look bad at all. So obviously, don't be sycophantic. You know, don't say, uh, you know, you're probably my reviewer, so I'm going to say really nice things about you. But just, just you know, express your heart, right? If you, if you feel good about a paper because it really was inspiring to you, just take a moment to say it was an inspiring paper. You know, or it was, it was seminal. It really led to a lot for you. Say that. Um, and... Um, uh, and that, you know, that, that of course makes them feel good, but it makes, it, 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 it brings credit to the whole field, I think. Okay? Um, the other thing, of course, is when you're talking about related work and comparisons, is that computer science is a very multi dimensional subject, right? Uh, you know, our, even if you're just thinking about programs, they may run faster, they may, may, be, they, may be, they may run in less space, they may be simpler to understand or more complicated to understand. They, they may be written in you know, some suitable language or run in certain environments. So it's very, very multidimensional. It's very rare to find that your work is sort of better in every dimension than somebody else's. Right? So what you don't want to do um, is to say, is to just focus on the areas where you're better. You say, well, I'm better in X and I'm better in Y, and well, uh, I don't tell you that I'm actually not so good on Z. Right? So because you, what you want to avoid is your reviewers saying the authors appear to be unaware that their system is completely hopeless when applied to Z. Right? That's a, that's, a, that's a bad thing for a reviewer to be able to say. It's quite disarming if you say, of course, our system really doesn't work in situation Z well at all. You better use some other system for that. It's very difficult to make something that's brilliant at everything. Okay? So it's not just honesty and good scholarship. It's actually disarming and, 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 you know, and helpful for readers if you explain where you're not so good as well as where you're great. Does that make sense? So it's actually it's, it's easy. You've just got to tell it the way it is. Amir, yeah. When you should tell weaknesses. When you should tell about weaknesses at the end of the related work. So in your related work section, you're saying, here are these other things, and um, uh, you can do a sort of comparative evaluation. I mean, either as you go along, or maybe at the end, you could say weaknesses of our approach or something, but somewhere towards the end. Yeah. Uh, um, yes. And try to avoid uh, the kind of related work section that says, um, brown and white did X, green and blue did this, uh, and sort of one sentence about each that more or less is no more than a list of citations, but doesn't give any value judgment. You might not even have read the paper, right? You know, try to provide some evidence that you actually know what's in that paper um, and that you value it. Yes? Sorry. As to what about the threats to validity section? Where the do you put that? Threats to validity? Tell me a bit more about what you mean. So uh, you have an approach, but your approach is not sound. It works in particular situations. It's, oh. not, it's not because you're comparing with somebody and that yeah. somebody is better. It's just your solution doesn't apply in particular. Right, so you've got an axe, which is good for cutting down trees, but not very good for chopping vegetables. Yeah, so say this. Yeah, that's no, sort of... Where? The question is oh, where? so I would... My instinct is always to... You're leading to the idea, right? You might want to say, on your path, you might want to say, you know, we're going to focus on building, on cutting down trees. I mean, vegetables are important, as we discussed in related work, right? So as you go on your path, you're forward-referencing to your related work section or your evaluation section to say, yeah, I know, we, I know we don't do everything and I'm going to discuss more there, but I don't want to get derailed right here. 
So forward referencing all the time, then you could have a sort of a slightly, because it's easier to do that big picture, sort of, you know, where are we in the vast firmament of computer science when you have all the scaffolding. Does that make sense? Anyone else? Hmm. Okay, so uh, related work. Well, so now that was, um, um, uh, let's see. So we still haven't done the payload of the paper. We've done introduction and related work. We haven't done very much of the paper. But in some ways, the, the body of the paper kind of writes itself. That's not the stuff that's so, so hard to write. So the only thing I really wanted to say about this middle chunk is think about your readers. And this is a bit similar to what I was saying about giving a good talk. Try not to recapitulate your journey. You were wandering in a maze filled with blind alleys and dragons and, you know, rotating knives which you wandered into, right? And it's rather tempting to lead your reader into the, you know, the alleyway with the rotating knives just to see how they get chopped up as well. Um, and I've read papers in which I have plowed through a page and a half of technical material thinking this is essential. And then at the end they say, so that turned out to be a really bad idea. We have a much simpler approach. It's really annoying when you do that, right? Really annoying. So that's what the paper is for, is to uh, avoid the heffalump trap. So don't recapitulate your journey. Just lead them straight to the goodness. There is an exception to that. If you're wandering, you know, you're taking your reader by the hand and you're leading them through the maze and you go past this door and through the door you see this vista of gardens and flowers and honeybees and lions and lambs lying down together and you just lead them past as if you hadn't even noticed and the reader is thinking, <laughs> have you read a paper like that? You think, why didn't you do the obvious thing? Right? Why are you doing this complicated thing? So there, there is sometimes when you really have to stop and say, uh, you know, you might think that this pathway would be a good one, but actually it doesn't work at all for the following reason. Or, you know, that's elaborated somewhere else. You, again, you don't want to get too derailed, but just acknowledging when there is a very obvious avenue that you're not taking, why you're not taking it is a good thing. Or you could say somebody else took it, and it's described very well in this excellent paper that I'll discuss a bit more in related work, but it turns out it doesn't work very well in the setting that I'm interested in, which is this, and on you go. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. I mean, think that it's also kind of, I mean, there should be like a trade-off between reproducibility of your paper, uh, I mean, make your idea, I mean, like some, I mean, other people think that it's possible to reproduce your work. Yes. Because, for example, if there are like, I mean, sometimes, I mean, I, I agree with you on this, that if, I mean, you have to show your idea, but maybe it's okay also to put like a, a paragraph that someone can skip, like like implementation details. And oh, I mean the reader can skip it. But yes. if I mean, but if it's another student like me, I mean the the student maybe need these details in order to continue working with. Oh yes. Yeah. So so when I say you know you want to present your idea, uh, I do mean you want to present it. It's a, it's a paper, right? You want to present it in enough detail that somebody could actually deploy it and use them use it themselves. And that means you know, you need a bit of detail, right? That's what the body of the paper is for. So it might be, you might say, here are some implementation details. You might say, look, there's a whole section about implementation, you know, a little bit later in the paper that gives more detail. So I think of it as being, somebody might read the papers, you know, they might read the introduction, they might get to the idea, and think that's an interesting idea, but actually I'm not interested enough in the details to plow through this, so then they jump to the next paper. So you know, almost wherever they get off the bus, they've taken something valuable away with them. Um, yeah, but don't leave out the meat. That's right. So I'm not talking about just a high-level general idea stuff. You've got to get to the meat. It's a paper. It's got content. Yeah, just uh, fine. How do you feel about just getting all of these details that most of the readers won't be interested in and, and just sending all of that to the supplementary material? Because that's somewhat, I, I've seen several papers doing that. Yeah, yeah. So usually you're constrained by length, one way or another, right? So you end up putting as much material in as will fit in the length constraints you're given, and the rest in supplementary material. Um, and so, I mean, a classic example is you, you state a theorem, you may give a brief proof sketch, and you say, you know, the full proof is worked out in detail, the supplementary material. Or you can see the code in the supplementary material, or there's, you know, much. Yeah. So it's a trade-off. I would, but it's pretty much always constrained by length. Right, what you can fit. You probably want anything. That, that's why all papers always end up hard against the length limit. You keep stuffing stuff in. Yeah, but it's good to have a, a, an appendix and reference the appendix. 
Um, even if it doesn't get published, you can cite it with a link. Yeah? Well, coming back to the rotating knives, let's say I'm working on simplifying something. So shouldn't I um, show the reader how difficult it was so they can appreciate how... Oh, nice yes, it. yes, yes. This is, so the, the best ideas are the simple ones. And sometimes a paper seems so simple, right, that the reader thinks, well, that wasn't very hard. What a, what a silly paper, right? That's, your, that's always your worry. Right. So you might want to show them the awful chopped up limbs of the previous people who uh, wandered into the, the alley. So it's, that's actually quite difficult, right? Because it's um, uh, uh, because because it falls straight into this trap of saying, well, I'm going to show you something simple, but here are various complicated things that I tried. So it's probably more convincing if you say, here are various complicated ways that other people tried. Right? You can go and read their paper. But I'm going to give you a much simpler way of tackling maybe not exactly the same problem, but I found a way to recast the problem so that it does have a simple solution. Um, but I, I, I would urge you probably not, as a first approximation, not to drag them through the complications or maybe illustrate a complication or something. Say, you know, uh, this is just to show how bad it could be if we didn't do this. Uh, something like that. Yeah. OK. Um, Let's see, yes. Uh, so intuition and examples, right? And, and the, even if you skip the details, you take away something valuable. This is a good lesson to take from a paper. It's also a good lesson to think about when you read somebody else's paper. If I, you know, I've left this paper, I've only read half of it, have I taken anything away? Or was it an investment that has essentially yielded me nothing because I didn't actually have enough uh, stamina to get to the real payload? <laughs> you know I mean? You want to do this sort of gradual thing of always offering something. Um, Conveying intuition is primary. I keep talking about examples. So instead of starting with, uh, let's see, what was this? Um, uh, yes, instead of starting with some general statement that you then specialize and give examples for, just like with a talk, start with an example uh, so that um, you get the kind of intuitive idea of what's going on. And then you could say, here's one example, here's another example, and now I've managed to extract a general case. So even if somebody only gets to the examples and does not even understand the notation in which you've written the general case, they've still got some intuitive feel about the problem you're trying to solve and how you're solving it. All right? So examples, 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 and examples first. Same thing in the paper as for a talk. Um, so here's, a, here's an example of me doing this in my paper. This was um, another paper I wrote some while ago. This is section two, in which I'm doing the setup of explaining the problem. And again, four lines into the setup, Right? I'm off with an example that I then use as an illustration for the whole of that background section to say what the problem is that I'm trying to solve and why it's an interesting one. Um, uh, yes, we talked about recapitulating the journey. Good. Uh, right, eight minutes to go, and last point. OK. Um, this is about your readership. Now. Of course, we've been concentrating on you as an author, uh, but trying to think about the audience. Um, but it's good to um, kind of use your audience, particularly um, to get help with guinea pigs. So a guinea pig is a person who reads your paper and gives you feedback. Right? Now, of course, the ideal guinea pig is already an expert in your field and has been following your work and is really keen to read your next paper. Um, these, these are hard to find. But you have quite a lot of friends, probably, you know, just colleagues, other research students in your department, other colleagues that you work with in some form or some way or another. And so you can ask them to just read your paper and, and say what they thought of it. Um, now, so two things about that. One is, um, it's like performing an experiment on a, on a, on a, you know, in a lab on a guinea pig. You know, you have a guinea pig, you would sort of inject the drug and you see if the guinea pig sort of falls over dead or whether it sort of leaps about. Right? But if you have, and then you're going to refine the drug based on it, you're going to rewrite the paper in the light of that feedback. If you use all your guinea pigs on day one, you know, inject them all, they all fall over dead, right? Then you don't have any left for when you've done the new version. <coughs> now, you might think, well, I could just ask my friend to read it again. But nobody can read your paper for the first time twice. Stands to reason, right? And that first time is really important. So by the time they read it another time, they read it completely differently 
when you're reading a, you know, a new draft of the same paper. You sort of skip and you, you say, I think I've read that before. It's a totally different experience to reading it for the first time. So just use your guinea pigs sparingly. You kind of use them one at a time. And that also is another thing about writing early, right? If you started early and you have drafts early, you can use your guinea pigs. If you haven't started until a week before the deadline, well, you know, you can barely use guinea pigs at all. Okay? Um, so, and even non-expert guinea pigs are quite helpful. Right, people who are you know, not even expert in your particular field, they should be able to make sense of the first few sections, right? if they're kind of motivated because you're, they're your friend. Right? They might not understand all the technical details. Um, but it's really important with your guinea pigs is to explain what you want. Because I tell you, it's an invariable um, property of guinea pigs that they will tell you about spelling and grammar first. That's what they will do. They'll, send you, they'll give you back paper with lots of markup about, you know, I would have put a comma here. You're not interested in that at this stage. You are interested in when they ceased understanding. Right? But they will not tell you that unless you look them in the eye. What's your name? Anita. An Anita? Anita. An Anita. Right? I'm going to look you in the eye, Anita, and say, I really want you to tell me when you get lost in this paper. You know? Because it's my fault, not yours, if you get lost, at least in the first few pages. Right? And I've got to make Anita believe that so that she will tell me. Um, because once you know, and then the dialogue, then you start a dialogue, right? So I got lost, you know, halfway down page two. I thought I was, I was okay, and then I got completely lost. And then you have a dialogue. You start writing on the whiteboard. You do diagrams. You say, what I really meant was this. And then he says, oh, that was what you meant. And you think, oh, darn, I just got to write that down. Right? It's amazing. All you have to do is to literally write down the things that you end up saying to your friend. Um, but you will find you explain it much better interactively than you do on paper. Um, so it's a... Uh, it's very important, I think, not to just give it to somebody and get written feedback, but to give it to somebody and say, just put a one mark where you get lost, and then we'll talk about it. That's my advice. Okay. And of course, you know, the better qualified they are, the more they know the field, the better, because they can get further through your paper. So that's, that's all good. Um, but the key thing is to get this sort of initial, uh, initial feedback. Uh, you can try and get feedback from people further away who really do know what they're talking about. Um, well, one, um, one that you can do is to uh, send people, even people you don't know, maybe you just met them once or twice at a conference or something, you bowled up and said that was interesting. Um, say, here's my paper, and, and you, know, you feature in related work. Uh, right, I just want to, you, you know, could you have a quick look to um, check if I, um, you know, if I presented your work fairly? People send me a paper like that, I think, well, at least I take a look. Right? After all, they, they, they're mentioning me. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, it's, it's, it's variable how well this works. But another, uh, another thing you can do is, um, is when you're at a conference, uh, you, you, you know, there's some uh, important person is giving a talk that you really think was a good talk and you enjoyed and you learned something from, then you know, introduce yourself afterwards and say, I thought that was a really you know, enjoyable talk. I learned a lot from it. Maybe ask them a question. You just form a little relationship with them. It doesn't necessarily need to lead to anything. But, um, but you know, the, another nice thing about computer science is that almost everybody is open to conversations with absolutely anybody, provided they've got something to talk about. And the something to talk about is the easiest place to start with is something that they've said. Right? If you walk up and say, can I tell you about my research? They're, they're, then they think, well, how long is this going to take? Right? If you say, can I ask a question about your talk? That's, that, it's a sort of more bounded thing. So that's a, it's all part of this um, interaction. OK. Um, let's see. Uh, the other thing is that when you get um, reviews, and uh, this, is, this is sort of more at the end of the pipeline, you submitted your paper and it's rejected, right? Um, and your reviews you know, make totally unjustified criticisms and you, you're sort of bleeding, right? That's really hard. Or even when you know, Anita has criticized my paper, right? Do, do, I, do I say, uh, Anita, you're really stupid, you know? <laughs> um, so uh, somehow you have to be, to be grateful for critique. Now, why should you be grateful? Well, one is you might be able to use it to improve your paper. But another is this. Do you remember about love? That was infinitely divisible. What about time? Not infinitely divisible. In fact, absolutely unfungible, as we were talking about three days ago. So if somebody, be it a reviewer or you know, one of your guinea pigs, has given you the gift of an hour of their time to read your paper, and in the case of a referee, to sit down and write a review, that is a free gift that they are giving you that they will never have again. 
that hour for them is gone. They're just an hour closer to being dead. So they are giving you a gift. And you should rejoice in that gift and say thank you. Right? So sometimes, you know, reviewers are really, um, uh, you know, sometimes reviewers are stupid, right? Sometimes reviewers are genuinely ill-informed and simply, you know, are just not qualified to write about it and just say wrong things. But that's pretty rare. Mostly reviewers kind of misunderstand something. And so when you finish bleeding from your reviews, look at them again, and instead of saying, stupid reviewer, um, you know, shouldn't have been allowed to review this paper, instead say, how could I write the paper so that not even this idiot could make that mistake? <laughs> okay? That's a constructive approach. It's not easy. This is very not easy. Um, but, um, but it's important. Yeah? Well, so how do you handle adversarial reviews? I mean, they, they, they come back to you, they're in written, you don't know who they're from. Uh, and, well, I suppose you, you'll handle them like this. You say, you know, is this criticism justified? Could I change the paper so that it would be, you know, is it a misunderstanding or is it simply, you know, sometimes you get a review that just says, I just don't agree with this idea. It's, it's, a, it's, an, it's, an, it's not a good approach, right? And you think, what can I do about that, right? So some, sometimes you just have to ignore it. There's nothing you can do, right? But... Um, but it's rare that they're actually aggressive. Usually they come together with, um, uh, you know, with, with things that they didn't like or that you could make better. It's not, not invariably. Yeah. What if you suspect they haven't actually read your paper? Oh, what if you suspect the reviewer hasn't read your paper? Well, uh, I think that's vanishingly rare, actually. Or maybe, maybe not in your experience. But I don't think I've ever read a review that I felt was from somebody who had not read the paper. Um, by and large, at least in computer science, I think people are pretty conscientious about reviewing. Um, and, um, yeah. I don't know. Has that, has, that, have you, has that happened to you? No. Has that ever happened to anybody? Okay, so let's not debug that problem. <laughs> it really is rare. I mean, they might have misunderstood. They might be ill-informed. They almost certainly would have read it. Uh, so thanking them is important, right? So at the end of your paper, it's worth taking those two lines at the end just to say thank the anonymous reviewers. If you've had guinea pigs who you know who they are, Mention them by name, right? It's, it's very cheap, um, and it's, it's, uh, that, that's the spreading the love thing. The anonymous reviewers, it's, just, it's kind of like just polite, but then they're not actually going to pin it on their wall. Um, okay, oh, so, that's, so, so that's it. Here's, here's my um, summary. It's 12.01, very good. Um, seven things you can do that will help you write better papers. There you go. Any other um, questions or observations? Uh, because, uh, yes, I'm all that stands between you and lunch, really, aren't I? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, do, do, do have a go at, at, at you know, f following some of these. I've, I've sort of tried to make them actionable, things you can actually do, rather than just aspire to it, mostly, you know, and, and know whether you're doing them or not. And you may have to fight with your advisor a bit about some of them. So, uh, you know, have the fight. Uh, in the end, you have to do what he or she says, though. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm? Okay, good.